No comment about And thank you um, to the organizer, Red May. I know this is largely, you know, something people do out of love and care, and there's a lot of, you know, energy and effort that goes into it, um, and a lot of volunteer time, um, so I really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming out here today. Um, just really, uh, especially want to give props to the people doing the whole marx um, You know, my Marx endurance is not what it used to be <laughs> before I had kids, so those of you, like, doing every... Every hitting everyone every week. That's really, really uh, an amazing thing. And it's such an important time to be having these conversations, right? Um, obviously, you know, there are places and times in history where people couldn't have these types of open conversations about systemic change, about systemic crises, um, and, and what comes next. But there's no doubt, right? There's, there's no doubt when you're I mean, I thought this whole Trump. Uh, Kim Jong-un thing was going to solve the world's problems, but apparently that's got called off. So uh, We're going to have to figure out an alternative um, on our own. Um, and I have to say, I mean, it's almost the exact 20th anniversary of when I met Grace Lee Boggs. Um, and how many people know who Grace Lee Boggs is? Just almost everyone. Okay. Um, have people seen the film American Revolutionary? Mm -hmm. Some folks have. Um, so I had no idea who she was, you know, a little over 20 years ago. Um, and then I read this book when it came out, Living for Change. Um, and it just so happened that that same year, I was a graduate student. Um, I wasn't really working on graduate school stuff much. Um, I was doing a lot of organizing. And one of the things I was organizing at UCLA um, that year was a conference, an activist conference, an Asian American activist conference. And uh, one of my mentors at UCLA suggested we should really bring Grace Lee Boggs. Um, and I, again, I didn't know much about her. I, so I read her books, um, and, I, and I invited her out, and, and she came, like, for almost nothing. We offered her, like, a plane ticket, you know, sleeping in someone's spare bedroom, and, like, $200 or something like that. Um, and it was just incredible uh, to meet her, and it, and it was really life-changing. And so I would have never imagined that I'd be speaking about her 20 years later. Um, I did work with her in Detroit for 14 years. I knew her for the last um, 17 years of her life. Um, she passed away in 2015. And even when I met her, I thought this was just me being the kind of radical graduate student in debt, not finishing a degree, <laughs> not really having a real job. And that's why I'm, you know, getting to know this fringe radical person that I had never heard of, that most of my active friends heard of, but clearly had done some very, very prominent things that others knew of, and now many, many more people know of. I mean, when she passed away in 2015, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, NPR called me for an interview. They all did obituaries right away. President Obama issued a statement from the White House uh, in tribute to her on behalf of him and Michelle. I, I just would have never imagined, you know, that, that people would be watching movies about her, people getting tattoos with Grace Lee Boggs on their arms and legs. Uh, you can go on Twitter and, and, and see people talking about how much, you know, whether they met her or whether they never had a chance to meet her. They're, they're quoting her, talking about how life-changing she was. And, and again, it's just astonishing, but I think this says something not just about her, but the times we live in and how important these ideas that she had and the things she did in the 20th century, which were very much on the margins of a very prosperous, stable, capitalist order, a very Eurocentric, you know, heteronormative, patriarchal order. As all those things are under contestation and coming unraveling, people are looking to the ideas uh, of people like Grace Lee Boggs in ways that really probably even transcend um, the interaction she had with people when she was alive. Um, so I'm going to talk about that um, today, really from my perspective. Um, I have to say, Grace Lee Boggs read a lot, read a lot more Marx than I ever have. Uh, some of you probably have read more Marx than I've had. She read Marx in German. She translated uh, some of the earliest writings of Marx, his is, is early um, humanist writings, uh, into English for the first time. She did some of the German translations, Raya, Raya Duny of Skaya, who was uh, very close to Trotsky um, and was a, a Russian immigrant, did the Russian translations, and they were part of a group with C.L.R. James called the Johnson Forest Tendency that actually published some of Marx's first writings in English, translations of his writings uh, on philosophy, uh, 
from the early phase of his life that people associate more with the humanist era of Marx uh, before he wrote the uh, Communist Manifesto, before he wrote Capital. So they became known as, as Marxist humanists. Um, like I said, they spent really years writing, debating, discussing, translating um, Marx. Um, and obviously, I, I can't match any of that study um, that they did. Uh, but you can read their writings um, from that era. Um, so I'm going to talk for probably only about um, less than half an hour. Um, and feel free to ask questions. I really want this to be a conversation. Um, maybe right now, I'm just curious if people want to throw out some reasons why you came or questions on your mind um, before I even start getting more into this? Curious. That's why I do in class, too. I just wait for students. I'll say why. <laughs> sure. Thank you. I mean, I, I, for a lot of people, probably I'm speaking for others where I know a little bit about Grace Lee Boss and what I know I admire, but I don't know very much. And I'm here to learn more. Okay, thank you. And how did you hear about her? Uh, how did I hear about her? When I first moved to Seattle in 1978, she was one of the people that a lot of my cohort was talking about. I helped start Central Co-op mm-hmm. when I first moved here, and a lot of people who were on the board or part of the collective were reading her work and James's work and talking about it. It was very informative for a lot of co- collective organizations and households in Seattle in the 70s. That's wonderful. Yeah, so that predates me knowing about her by, by 20 years. And, it dates me. <laughs> and I think that's right. I mean, I think a lot of people read their work in the 60s and 70s. Then they did a lot of really locally based work in Detroit. A lot of those 60s organizations kind of, you know, either became very local or kind of fizzled out. Um, and, uh, and then people started to get to know her again after her book came out in 98 and then the film came out and we did a lot of national touring. We were talking about the big events we do with people like Angela Davis and Michael Hart and Emmanuel Wallerstein and other people over the years. I think the U.S. Social Forum being in Detroit in 2010 also played a big role in increasing her stature. We had an event with like 700 people or something, an amazing event. You can listen and watch that online or you can read an edited version of it in the paperback version of this book I did with Grace uh, called The Next American Revolution. So I'm gonna talk from my knowledge of her really if you want to know more, you can watch the film, American Revolutionary, the autobiography she did, <coughs> Living for Change, uh, the book we did together, um, The Next American Revolution. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what's been going on in Detroit um, based on a book I wrote called The 50 Year Rebellion. Um, and I was saying, if, if you want, those little postcards are not just ads, they're also coupons to get a discount on the book from, from the press. Um, Anyone else to say how you heard about Gracie Boggs or what's on your mind coming to this event? I showed up yesterday at the Labor Temple. Yeah. And I'm trying to get signatures for I-1600, an initiative for universal health care. Mm-hmm. And, I, I, and that's why I'm here, but I'm also interested in the content. I didn't even know about Red Bay until um, I was there. Okay, I hadn't great. seen anything about it. And I'm a union member, and it just, uh, I thought, wow, that's cool. Well, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, go ahead. Was, yeah. Um, yeah, I was at Redman last year, and um, they talked about the fetish of the material. And the, the conversation, and there was a panel at CMOU that I kept thinking about that all year, what we talked about. <laughs> I thought these people align so much with what I, I think about. Um, you know, because my grandma wrote a commentary in a Catholic newspaper that was socialist leaning. And she told me in private that she felt she was socialist, but she would use the church to kind of justify, you know, the social teachings. And so um, I joined a, a feminist group called Women Empowering Women that's through the New Freedom Hall. Uh-huh. And we're reading uh, Frederick. Uh, he collaborated with Marx. It's uh-huh. very humanist. Uh, I, I'm on the spot, so I'm really That's Angles. But it's yeah. about marriage and the family. Sure. Yeah. And it's um, we're re- we're dissecting the chapters, and it's very humanist. And I thought our whole society is like structured like this, and it's so fascinating. And I like it when it's based human because we just went to the one Newton, and I like him. It sounded like he became so nervous that things <laughs> became like machine parts instead of humans or mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. But. Um, 
it's really good. I'm, I'm glad to learn about her. Yeah, and it is, I mean, there are all kinds of ways people come across her. Like I said, I happen to be doing this event, and a, and a mentor who had met her in the 60s, uh, or maybe the early 70s, you know, um, tipped me off, um, someone who'd come out of the movement. But I mentioned there's this film, American Revolution, and I think it's back on Netflix. You can watch it, um, or you can watch it, you know, um, through a DVD. Um, it's won a Peabody Award, you know, it's, it's for, for, for journalism. Um, it's been broadcast nationally on PBS. It's won multiple film festival awards. Um, and, and the director has gone on to do other, you know, major projects as well. But the way she met Gracie Boggs is around 2000, 2001, maybe, probably 2000. Um, yeah, because I was still in L.A. Um, so I was living in L.A. till 2000. I moved to Detroit till 2014, and then I moved to Seattle four years ago. Um, she was a film student, and her name was Grace Lee. Yeah. And so she was yeah. doing a documentary about people named Grace Lee, and it was this kind of <laughs> sort of subversive take on stereotypes of Asian American women to talk about how they're not all alike. And so she wanted, like, dramatically different Grace Lees, you know, um, and then she found out there was this, you know, 90-something Grace Lee who lived in the black community her whole life and was a radical. Um, and it just so happened that we were having this small conversation, really, on campus. And I had put this little poster up, <laughs> flyer up, and she saw it. And I thought, what the heck is this woman doing? <laughs> who is that woman? But it turned out, you know, I've known her ever since, the filmmaker Grace Lee. And, and now she's doing really, really incredible things. Um, but that's how she met her. Um, and so it's just amazing the different ways you know people people can connect. Um, but there's obviously some reason why why these underlying reason why these connections happen. Um, so I'll just say a little bit about Grace's background, and then I'll get more into some just a few of the um, ideas that I think are really central to understanding her. Um, so um, she was born in 1915, and her father owned a Chinese restaurant. So she was a very part of a very small population of American-born Chinese, U.S. citizens, you know, in the early 20th century, because that was the era of Chinese exclusion, people have heard about, right? There was a law banning Chinese from immigrating to the country and banning the immigrants who were here from being U.S. citizens, right? Um, on top of lots of other types of discrimination and, and, and racism. What do you think different. of doing that today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that really did, it did set a trend for a lot of the anti-immigrant um, discrimination um, in the 20th century. That was 1882 when that started. Um, Where was she born? She was born in Providence, Rhode Island. Yeah, above her father's star. But he moved to New York and he ran Chinese restaurants. But he didn't run your Chinatown Chinese restaurants. He actually ran a, a restaurant and then there were two of them. Huge restaurants on Broadway. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you read Henry Miller's one of his autobiographies, he actually talks about how much he loved eating at Chin Lee's, her dad's restaurant. Uh, and if you watch the film, Henry and June, that's the NC-17 one, it was a very <laughs> scandalous one when it came out. Yeah, there's actually a scene with Uma Thurman saying, I remember our first date at Chin Lee's, because she's playing, she's playing June Miller. Um, so he was very prominent for a time, and then he had some problems with taxes or something, and he lost everything. Uh, there was a time when he was very prominent. Because of that, they actually lived, you know, in a... In a formerly all-white neighborhood that, you know, her dad had his contractor buy, his Irish contractor buy in his name so they could live in Jackson Heights, which is now one of the most diverse neighborhoods, you know, in the whole world, uh, in, in, in Queens. Um, so she didn't have your typical upbringing. She had for a Chinese American at that time a relatively privileged upbringing. So she got a college degree from Barnard, which is, you know, the Women's College of Columbia at that time. She went to Bryn Mawr and got a PhD in philosophy. Uh, she actually got a scholarship that was intended for international students from China, but because of the war, they, they couldn't attract international students, so she, she got that scholarship, um, and she studied philosophy. And at first, she wasn't interested in school at all, then she got into philosophy, and then she was really struck by how much the Depression was even shaping these academics, like thinkers like John Dewey. I mean, she wrote her dissertation about um, another pragmatist philosopher, progressive thinker, named George Herbert Mead. And when she got her PhD, it was really pointless to even think of getting a job in academia as a Chinese-American woman. So she moved to Chicago, because George Herbert Mead had been at the University of Chicago. Um, 
And she ended up working as a library assistant for $10 a week. And as she tells the story, and you can, she tells it much better than me in the film, she didn't have a lot of money. She had a very hard time finding a place to live. And so she ended up uh, living in the basically the, the basement of the home of a woman who took pity on her and let her live there basically for free. But it was a rat-infested <laughs> basement. And there were organizers coming around talking about ending rat-infested housing. <laughs> And she got connected with them. It turned out eventually she gets connected with this socialist. Uh, uh, she was involved with both the Socialist Workers Party and the Workers Party. There were lots of splits, <laughs> lots of <laughs> groups back then. Um, but through that, she gets connected to two things. The March on Washington movement, which was led by A. Philip Randolph to protest racial segregation in the military and in the defense plants. Uh, FDR compromised, and he desegregated or at least issued a desegregation order, didn't have a full effect, of the defense plans. Right? And she says she saw the power of a movement. She saw this mass movement of African Americans. And she was also doing work, um, again, in this socialist uh, group that led her to meet C.L.R. James and Mariah Junioska, as we talked about. And they were a very small group. They were a tendency. And, and within the Trotskyist movement, what was different is she wasn't a committed Trotskyist like uh, James and Junioska were. But what was different about the Trotskyist movement was it was anti-Stalinist. And it allowed, you know, it allowed uh, more uh, minority positions to sort of take root and, and express ideas and flourish than the sort of hard centralism of, of the, the Communist Party did. And really, that's what allowed them to publish all of these writings about the early Marx and his ideas about, uh, as she said, you know, real poverty is not just a lack of material things. Real poverty is believing that wealth and material things, that, that wealth is rooted in material things, right? Real wealth is more rooted in our, the expansion of our human capacities, right? These were the types of things they were drawing from Marx. Um, and, and as a philosopher, she had been really struck by Hegel's way of thinking dialectically. So whereas a lot of dialectical materialism, as, as it was sort of taught in sort of study groups even when I was in college, is... Okay, so what Marx did was he erased all that idealistic notions that Hegel had, and he focused on the material. But what they were pointing out, and they were really some of the first thinkers in English to start, to start doing this, was that Marx had this whole other uh, 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 body of writings that were about alienation, that were about um, hum humanist ideas that went far beyond the things that he talked about which were also important, you know, uh, about capital and how political economy functions. Um, and so she was, C.L.R. James, who's one of the most prominent, you know, black Pan-Africanist thinkers of the 20th century, um, was, was also, you know, a, a dedicated Marxist. But he was really interested also in Hegel. And, and Grace's ability to read German and having Sidney Hegel really was a creation of that connection. And what they ended up doing was they, they actually also reread Lenin's writings. So again, at that time, even again, when I was still you know, learning from the people who got trained in ideas of Revolutionary Party in the 60s, the idea was Lenin was the one who professionalized the idea of a, uh, a revolutionary party. This is what the idea of Bolshevism comes for, that Mensheviks were kind of the wishy-washy social democrats. And Lenin was the one who really put the emphasis on dialectical materialism and, and a hardcore idea of professional cadre at the root of the party. And what they saw was Lenin actually had a lot of debates <laughs> about a lot of different things. But particularly after the Bolsheviks took power, that Lenin realized that what the country needed was not just for a Bolshevik party to be in power or declare you know, a, a, you know, a communist state. What it needed was a cultural revolution. And he meant that in some just basic ways, like a lot of people couldn't read. So how could they be carrying out these plans that they had for modernization and growth and industrialization, the spread of communism, when people couldn't necessarily read. So they had to figure out ways to educate people and to communicate people. Um, but he also saw that simply taking power didn't mean that you would be able to transform all the relationships that people had. People still had a lot of you know, uh, uh, practices and traditions from the old order. People still had class hierarchies, you know, gender hierarchies, ethnic hierarchies that were part of the old order. And what they determined from this reading of Lenin was that you can't, and you can find it in Gramsci and, and later in other writers, that you can't simply focus 
the idea of building a revolution solely on the idea of seizing state power. For all kinds of reasons, there's obviously people that are against the idea of top-down control of the state or one-party rule or what Marxists, Leninists at one time called the dictatorship of the proletariat. But even putting aside those debates or the role of armed struggle, all those things, if you set aside, if you simply think the revolution is going to solve all your problems once you take power, you may end up taking power through means that actually, you know, don't in any way transform human relationships, right? That are still reinforcing patriarchy, that are still reinforcing, you know, hierarchy or militarism or an emphasis on charisma or power, right? And so they started to reread Lenin. And again, it was largely, you know, in the 30s and 40s, it was largely the people in the minority part of the Marxist movement, the Trotskyists, you know, the anti stalinists who were doing this kind of thinking. Later, some of this critique emerges within the CP and, and, and uh, uh, the sort of third international. Um, but it was an opportunity for her to really put her skills as a philosopher into dialogue with these ideas and, and organizing around revolution. Um, so this group forms, um, again, with a kind of uh, non-orthodox uh, view of, of Marx. They are concerned about organizing workers, but they also see African Americans and women as revolutionary forces. And so the way they try to bring all this together is they really make Detroit their headquarters. Uh, and Grace moves there in the early 1950s. And again, their thinking is Detroit is where, you know, the unions formed, the in industries are at their peak uh, in America, and the proletariat, right, the industrial proletariat is, is most strong. Uh, she ends up through this work meeting James Box who was a Chrysler worker who grew up in the Jim Crow South, African-American from Alabama, didn't have any of the college degrees or background in formal education that Gracie Boggs had, and they formed this really unique uh, duo. She's a Chinese-American, he's black, she has a PhD. Again, his experience in the plant, growing up in the South, resisting the Ku Klux Klan, gave her a whole new way of thinking about these questions that for her had been largely intellectual uh, um, dilemmas prior to this time. And so she lives in the black community and, and really becomes a part of the black community and sees these struggles in a whole new way. Eventually they break with the others in the Johnson Forest tendency. And the reason they did was what James Boggs observed and what they analyzed was that, you know, what today we think of as outsourcing and downsizing and all those things, they associated with automation in the 50s and 60s. And they saw that the industrial workforce was already starting to shrink. And what it was doing was creating a permanent class of what James Boggs called the outsiders, particularly in Detroit, young black men. Um, and they also saw that uh, over time, the uh, labor movement, which had been very radical in the 1930s, you know, Walter Ruther had been a socialist, right? He was an insurgent against the old AFL had become much more bureaucratized. And there were actually young black radicals challenging um, the racism and bureaucratization of the, um, the labor movement. Um, of course, they were deeply involved in the civil rights movement, even more so in the black power movement um, as the movement grows in the North. And Detroit really becomes a Northern center of civil rights and black power movement. There are splits within the civil rights and black power movement. They are more on the Malcolm X side of, of things than the Martin Luther King side of things at that time. And they became very influential for a new generation of black radicals in groups like the Revolutionary Action Movement, or RAM, which was also very close to Malcolm X, and DRUM, the Dodge Revolution Union Movement. Basically, they're creating wildcat strikes of black workers uh, in Detroit, challenging not just GM and the big three automakers, but also challenging what they see as the conservatism of the United Auto Workers or the racism of the United Auto Workers. But at this time, they're still focused on getting all these forces together still into some kind of Marxist, Leninist, revolutionary party. Right? And their thinking about that really starts to change with the 1967 Detroit Rebellion. So I wrote this book on the 50th anniversary of it last year, and I tried to trace the significance of that history of 50 years. And what they really determined in 67, let's see how I'm doing on time, uh, 
was that they had not done enough and that the movement had not done enough to make a distinction between a rebellion and a revolution. That so much of their efforts in trying to bring down capitalism, even while they were doing these study groups and thinking about philosophy, was still focused on getting people to rise up against capitalism. And this is in a lot of Lenin's writings and Marx's writings and Mao's writings and so on. And they determined that rebellions are a stage in the process of revolution. They are an opportunity where people stand up and say they won't take this anymore. They break the threads of the old order. They disrupt you know, the, the, the ruling class's uh, uh, modes of governance but they do not establish the new values, the new relationships, or the new models of economics and governance that will really represent a revolutionary society. And it doesn't happen overnight. These are things that happen over years, or decades, or even many generations. Right? And so they began to realize that so much of the thinking about revolution is, well, what kind of party is it going to be? Do you use armed you know, struggle, or do you use the ballot? Um, do you um, prioritize race or gender or class? Do you uh, focus on the uh, revolutionary forces at the center of advanced capitalist nations, or do you focus on those in the third world fighting against imperialism? None of these questions have actually dealt with what do we do uh, when we take power, or as we take power, or before we take power. How will we actually run society differently? What? Are we going to have citizenship, or is that, are we going to have borders? Are we going to have a constitution? What's it going to say? Are we going to have you know uh, ownership, or, or is everything going to be uh, uh, collectively owned and managed? These are the types of things that, of course, people had talked about in many different ways, right? And uh, but but in their experience, in the U.S. left, they had never really come together uh, in that kind of way. So they really went back to back to thinking about these questions. And, and they said the rebellion forced them to do that because the rebellion exposed a lot of problems uh, in Detroit and cities across the country. It led to some reforms, things like affirmative action or you know, uh, civilian review boards of police. Um, it led to some people to become incorporated into the system. You had black mayors, you have you know, women becoming uh, increasingly part of corporations and academia. But it didn't solve any of the underlying problems or contradictions, right? And that's what they wanted to do. And they realized that required a lot more thinking. And that as uh, the factories shut down, as the unions became weaker and weaker in power, as we now see pretty much all of the New Deal state as, as in some ways been dismantled or, or threatened to be dismantled by neoliberalism, and as the new contradictions of people wanting to be part of the system who had previously been excluded heightened, all of these contradictions needed to be understood and analyzed. Um, and that's where they, they did a lot more thinking, they did a lot less agitating, and, 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 and they did most of that at the local level, which is why people didn't hear about them um, for a time. But in the 70s, again, they came out with this really important book called Revolution and Evolution in the 20th Century, which is, again, about this idea of changing our concept of revolution. She, she drew, for instance, the Boxer drew, for instance, on Amilcar Cabral, who was a leader of the revolutionary movement in Guinea Bissau. And the panel we did uh, a week and a half ago included people who are actually much more experts on that than me, which is why I'm really excited to meet them. Um, but Amilcar Cabral had a, a concept of building the revolution as we fight. Right? So again, not simply focus on taking power, but establishing, even in our own organizations, amongst our grassroots, putting into practice already the change we wish to create. Right? Or creating what, if you read some of Lenin, uh, are known as dual power structures. That even within this corrupt, decadent, you know, dying capitalist order, we are already <coughs> creating, whether it's through the co-ops in, in Seattle in the 1970s, or whether it's through childcare collectives, or whether it's through healthcare collectives, or whether it's just through our own political organizations, we begin to model and create a different set of relationships and, and, and practices that will anticipate, or some people now use the term prefigure, what a socialist or post-capitalist order uh, would look like. 
So that's what they really started talking about. They started talking about Detroit as a place where they were trying to, to do that. Um, and they began to look at people like Martin Luther King in a different way, because King was doing a lot of that thinking as well in ways that they didn't appreciate at the time. And they began to talk about how transformation must be two-sided of our structures and ourselves. Right? So this idea of change yourself to change the world becomes really important to them. Because the US empire had not just damaged other countries and peoples who were oppressed, the US empire also damaged pretty much everybody who lived in this country in some way that needed to be, um, that needed to be challenged. Um, they talked about the American Revolution will be the first one to give up things, that we had extracted so much wealth from the rest of the world and condemned so many people to poverty, and now we know done so much damage to you know, uh, uh, the environment in the process that we need to think about, again, living with less, thinking about what we, ne what we need versus you know, um, what, what people sort of aspire to in a consumer society. And again, this idea of uh, reversing the notion that the ends justifies the means to talking about how the means are actually an expression of the society we're creating, right? You see this in King, you see this in Gandhi in different ways, you see this in the writings of Paulo Freire on education um, as a revolutionary process. Um, and you see this today, uh, for instance, um, in someone who really was a, a student uh, and, and a friend of Gracie Boggs, um, Adrienne Marie Brown's concept of emergent strategy. If people are familiar with this book, you can check it out. She talks about the relationship between self-care and movement building in ways that uh, people have found very profound. Um, so all of this adds up to this. Excuse yeah. me, did you say the title of her? Emergent, emergent strategy. Emergent strategy. Yeah. And it's based also on the writings of an author named Margaret Wheatley. Um, is this all in your book, a lot of this information? Yeah, it is. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, and the last thing I'll talk about, and this is really the focus of the book, is how they began to view Detroit as a post-industrial city of hope. There's so much talk about Detroit on the right and left as the sort of negative model of everything that's gone wrong, right? Um, the right wing literally you know, blames everything on uh, uh, liberals and black politicians, right? But there are also people left that say, you know, Detroit just represents complete destruction and chaos because of you know, the problems of capitalism. And of course, they agreed more with the left wing critique, but they also saw new possibilities rising out of the ashes um, in Detroit. So of course, they were very critical of you know, the new elite of uh, African Americans and labor leaders that took power in Detroit. Right? There was, for instance, um, a moment where General Motors went to the black mayor of Detroit, Coleman Young, who came out of the left, you know, stood up to McCarthy, um, was a real hero uh, among uh, civil rights and labor movement leaders. Um, but when GM said, uh, we're moving our factories out of Detroit, and we can now build our new factory anywhere we want, the only way we will stay in Detroit is if you give us all the land for free and give us over $100 million in, you know, basically tax, uh, right, tax abatements, so. subsidies. And so Coleman Young tore down an entire neighborhood called Pole Town in Detroit. Over a thousand homes, churches, schools, businesses. They took it all by eminent domain. They had to chase out the last people and basically arrest them. Um, and that was an example of even someone, Coleman Young, who came out of the civil rights movement, the labor movement, had been basically a fellow traveler of the Communist Party, still felt that the only way to try to make people's lives better would be to basically be dependent on GM to bring back some jobs. And of course, they never hired more than like 3,000 people <laughs> while they were shutting down plants that employed you know, 10, 15, 20,000 people. But that's how bad things were around 1980, time Chrysler almost went bankrupt, and um, GM, uh, again, uh, made this basically you know, extortion from the city <coughs> of Detroit. And it makes us think about, again, you know, today we wonder, well, what would we do, you know, if Amazon really does pack up and leave, right? Because of the head tax or because of, you know, whatever, we won't give them another billion dollars in subsidies. Um, or, you know, again, obviously the same debates have happened over many years with what happens if Boeing leaves and they have left and they've gone to other places that are, you know, less unionized, right? And they've automated and they've outsourced. 
Um, Detroit is a place that had to deal with that. Basically, even the auto industries that stayed all moved out to the suburbs. So the majority, over 80% black, increasingly poor and working class city, had to deal with how do you rebuild an economy? Coleman Young turned to the casino industry. And so Detroit was one of the first places to have full-scale Vegas-style casino gambling you know, in, inside the city. And the Bogs has said there has to be an alternative to these you know, parasitic forms of uh, extractive capitalism. Um, and that's where they began to look at the grassroots for bottom-up solutions. They began to look at the vacant lots, the shuttered schools, looking for new ways. And so they talked about um, the importance of urban farming. And urban farming would be a way for people to feed themselves, people a way to clean up these vacant lots. But they also became a symbol of how, again, you could have an economy rooted in people's needs, in cooperation, in mutuality, in caring for the land, rather than pure ex exploitation and extraction. <laughs> um, they talked about freedom schools, right? As you know, the freedom schools started in Mississippi during Freedom Summer, um, when schools were segregated and so many you know, black youth were denied a right to the education. They started creating their own schools. Well, Detroit, people started doing the same thing. Um, talking about creating a whole different type of school, not making our schools equal to the suburbs or, you know, uh, uh, um, basically the Supreme Court ruled that you couldn't bus black students from Detroit to the suburban schools. And so all the solutions had to happen within the city. The sub suburban schools were very hostile to the black students from Detroit. So they had to talk about how do we have a whole different type of education, um, not just how do we create equity within the existing school system, right? And of course, as you know, Betsy DeVos came in and threw millions of dollars at these Republican politicians and you know charter school operators, um, and they pretty much dismantled the whole public school system in Detroit. Michigan has a billion dollar a year charter school industry. Eighty percent of them are for profit. So they don't have public schools per se. Uh, Detroit closed 200 public schools in the time I lived there. Oh. Um, and the school system was taken over by uh, an emergency manager. So they, yeah. Detroiters didn't run their own school system. The, the governor just appointed a financial manager to run it for them. And these were people who had no background in education, generally. The, as you may know, the governor appointed a bankruptcy attorney to run the entire city of Detroit for almost two years. He had power over every single decision, not just the finances, the policing, the fire, the parks. Uh, he could put every, anything in the city he wanted up for sale. He could abolish any union contract he wanted to. That's the type of authoritarian power that the Republicans gave the uh, governor over Detroit, or any city for that matter. This emergency Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's basically, you know, this is. Uh, uh, what allowed this billionaire Dan Gilbert to come in and pretty much buy up the entire downtown of Detroit. He's the guy that owns the Cavaliers. <laughs> um, and uh, he now owns over 100 buildings in downtown Detroit. So he took advantage of the emergency manager rule and the financial crisis. 140,000 homes in Detroit went into foreclosure during a short period of time. Um, about a third of the city was vacant land. But even then, they mainly wanted the downtown properties. Um, so. That was the danger, that is the danger, not just for Detroit, but again, obviously there are people now in the White House that would like to use this model of authoritarian rule and you know, selling everything off to the 1% uh, for the whole country, right? I mean, Betsy DeVos has erased almost every regulation <laughs> she could so far, and Scott Pruitt's done the same thing, and you know, Rick Perry and all these other people are doing the same thing. Um, and uh, you know, Detroit was in many ways a, a model for that. And then not to say that the Democrats had a much better model. I mean, the Obama's bailout, so-called bailout of the big three, was mainly subsidies for the corporations. They didn't help the workers. They created a two-tier system where the new workers hired by GM, Ford, and Chrysler were making $14 an hour without the same benefits that the UAW workers previously were, were making $28 an hour for with full benefits. Right? So all it did was create this two-tier system. Um, but it did, quote unquote, save some of those jobs. Right? And, and that's where we're at today now. I mean, are we simply talking about saving you know, the last vestiges of whatever was halfway decent about the liberal era of capitalism? And Detroit was, in many ways, the best example of it. 
livable wage for workers, civil rights advances, you know, representation in government for, for African Americans. Um, but all of that has been assaulted. And Detroit was targeted because it had made so many advances. Right? Um, are we simply going to talk about holding on to those last vestiges of that while the seas are rising and the glaciers are melting and people are dying every day you know, at the hands of, 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 of racist po police officers? Or do we, as the boss has said, need to rethink everything? Not just who's in power, not just who has the wealth, but how we define what it means to do work. What is the value of work? What is the value of humanity? What is the value of the earth? What do we mean by concepts of citizenship? What do we mean by you know, uh, uh, mutuality? What is our debt to future generations? Obviously, these are things that so many you know, activists and thinkers, indigenous folks, people of color, anti-colonial leaders, feminists, queer studies people have been thinking about, are thinking about, right? And Grace Lee Boggs has become a way for a lot of these people, you know, uh, a lot of these different streams of thought to come together, right? And that's why she's been held up as one of the, you know, inspirations for the Women's March, you know. She's gone mainstream. Like I said, there's this movie. I mentioned it at the last talk. Does anyone have Netflix? And there's a movie about Barack Obama when he was a college student. It actually, I'm a spoiler alert if you don't want to. <laughs> actually ends with Grace Lee Boggs and James Boggs becoming his role models. <laughs> to resolve his racial identity crisis and become an activist. Um, apparently the guy that wrote it is a friend of a friend of mine. He also did the book, Go the Fuck to Sleep, or something like that. <laughs> um, writes about hip hop a lot. Um, uh, so I get a kick out of that because, again, uh, I'm not gonna try to control every single thing that people think about Grace Lee Bucks. You can't do that. If you want people reading and talking about someone in a much bigger way than what I could have done, you know, 20 years ago, then it happens, you know? <laughs> Presidents talk about them. <laughs> Hollywood directors make movies about them. Um, you know, and, and oh my God, one of these right-wing groups was all over, you know, Breitbart, whatever, talking about how the University of Maryland was doing a conference honoring this communist Grace Lee Boggs, <laughs> and they wanted everyone to you know, defund that university and boycott them. And so, you know, she, she falls into those categories too. Um, but that's, that's dialectics. That's the world that's constantly changing, a world shaped by contradiction. And what Grace has taught us is we have to understand them, struggle through them, and realize, again, there's not going to be one quick solution, but we have to dedicate our lives and many, many generations of lives to expanding what it means to be a human being. So I will cut off there. Thanks. Let's talk about this. All right, Scott, I'll put you on the spot. Sure. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to channel Grace and James. OK. After the last two weeks in Seattle, where we've seen the most naked and arrogant grab for corporate power over the city government, uh, by being asked to pay taxes to do something about the, the symptoms. I mean, capitalism is, is producing homelessness, it's producing rising rents now. The city council is just trying to put a band aid over it and get some money to throw its way. And, and it's going back to that classic. New Deal liberal notion of at least maybe the corporation should pay taxes or something or businesses should play. Yeah. But that principle has been is no longer accepted by business. Right. To the point where even if it's a, a, a measly sum, someone like Amazon will will fight to win this to the end. And money is coming in now from all over the world to do this, to have a referendum and so forth. Here we are. You know, the city has changed, 114,000 new people have come in the last five years. The, the largest uh, uh, profession now we find out is programmers, 60,000 people. Everybody who lives in the city is being told, you know, you really won't be able to afford to retire here. Why don't you think about going to Cleveland? So, Grace and James, come into our lives and, and give us some advice for what you learned in Detroit. Yeah. Channeling through Scott. 
Well, you know, um, I've been thinking about this. <laughs> I know that's I'm starting a discussion. Yeah, I mean, again, I never imagined I'd be in this position, you know, to channel them. Um, I, I, I was a student of their writings. I was, you know, a mentee of Grace. And then she named me in her will as one of the people she wanted to really take responsibility, you know, for carrying on uh, um, but you her, have to her, her writings. With the dead, though, you know? <laughs> I was in the car the other day, and they said Jeff Bezos had become the richest man in the world because I guess the Gates had given away more of their money to charity by then or their own foundation. And his wealth had gone up $50 billion in the past year. <laughs> it's just incredible, right? It's more than the GDP of right? many nations. Um, and, uh, and, right, and, and we're talking about, what is it, 0.2% of Amazon's you know, profits? Jeff Bezos, they said in every 10 seconds make what makes what an average Amazon worker makes in a whole year. I mean, this, even, this doesn't even really compare, I don't think, to the Gilded Age, to the robber barons, you know, the savage, you know, uh, uh, violent attacks on workers, obviously, you know, uh, were really, you know, abhorrent then. But this scale of wealth on a global, you know, level is, is just unprecedented, right? I mean, it's, you know, if they watch like Marvel, you know, Avengers, Infinity War, they get a sense of the scale at which they're, 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 they're uh, reaching for. Um, and uh, I think about how when I was in Detroit during the foreclosure crisis, the average home was selling for $7,000 in the city of Detroit. Um, it's gone up since then, but it's nothing compared to what's happened in this city, where it's eight hundred something thousand dollars on average um, for a house. You know, I mean, the people we're hiring to be professors can't even remotely afford, uh, even if both of them are professors, even to buy homes in, in Seattle. Um, and uh, I think also about the pitch that Michigan and Detroit made to Amazon. Is anyone, were you guys following this national contest where everyone had to bow down before Jeff Bezos and offer to, you know, give their, you know, whatever, their next, you know, 12 children to him? Um, so, um, and Detroit wasn't that different than Chicago's or other places, but it was pretty extreme. The, Amazon would, of course, get free land and tax abatements and subsidies, which, you know, everyone was offering. But what they also said was, uh, you get to keep all the income taxes that your own employees pay. So it's not even like you give it to the government and then the government gives you all these, you know, corporate welfare handouts. You just take it straight from your own employees' paychecks. It's like, it's like a feudalism, right? How can that be legal? How can and the property taxes. And, I mean, these are all under, you know, state regulations, right? Um, so not necessarily the federal, right? Uh, but the state income tax and the state and local property taxes. So you don't just get them waived if you're Amazon. You get to take all the things from the from the workers, if you know, if there's a uh, Starbucks in your building, they're paying the you know, taxes directly, you know, to the to the landlord rather than to the government. I mean, this is how far they want to, and they had to basically eliminate even the you know uh, limited amount of power that black people had over their city government in Detroit to do it. They had to just wipe out the power of the city council. Wipe out the power of the mayor. Make sure the people in there would only do things that are consistent with what these billionaire, neoliberal, you know, austerity, uh, uh, authoritarian rule folks wanted. And so Detroit got cut. <laughs> I don't know where exactly this Amazon, you know, second headquarters is going to end up. But this is what they are reaching for. This isn't even capitalism as we know it. This is like the one percent, even when they're already wealthy use all their power to get wealthier, right? And that's why I'm saying, you know, the fact that Detroit already went through this in the 70s. Two things happened in the 70s, right? You had basically almost every white person started leaving the city. Detroit ends up today, you know, by the, really by the 90s, uh, less than 
um, white, uh, or it had been at one time almost all white as a city. Uh, and the corporations and the and the uh, uh, the auto industries basically leave. Like I said, even if they don't leave Michigan, they're moving to the suburbs of Detroit rather than staying in the city. Right. So Detroit had to deal with this dual crisis, interrelated, and had to figure out again: Do you simply somehow think that you know electing Democrats is going to fix all this? Do you somehow think that the corporations are come back if you give them more subsidies? You know, is a billionaire like Dan Gilbert going to come along and save the city? He's been described as a savior. The New York Times had a uh, headline that called him um, a missionary's quest to save Detroit or rebuild Detroit. Um, and this is the liberal New York Times, right? This is in the Wall Street Journal. Um, and they said, no, of course, we've learned that none of those are solutions. And they also learned that the thinking we did to try to take power or confront capitalism and white supremacy in the 60s and 70s was not sufficient to figure out an answer. Right? And so what we needed to do was really have people experimenting and building and organizing at the grassroots, of thinking more creatively, of thinking about thinking outside the box, right? And using the spaces that capital abandoned as a place where we could start practicing these non-commercial relationships. There's very few of those left in Seattle. Right? Like, as I was saying in the last part, like, not only have they taken all the land, they have an app for basically every bodily function that you have that they now want to profit off of. Right? Um, but Detroit is still a place, despite all the assaults that they've faced and you know, all the disenfranchisement, dispossession, where people still can come together and need to come together. Because, of course, you also know they shut off water to 100,000 people. They shut off water to 100,000 people. And when they shut your water out, they can condemn your home. They can have child protective services come and say it's not safe for your children to live there. And this is the level at which they're willing. There's, there's no, you know, there is no floor at which they won't sink below, right? They don't even, I mean, they don't even want most of the land in Detroit. They just want the people who are there and need schools and education and child care and, 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 and health care. They just want them out so they don't have to pay for that. Or they want to just take all those education funds <laughs> and give them to private charter school, you know, uh, for-profit charter school operators, right? Um, and so there, there's a level at which this, this attack is happening, again, that, that, that just, even goes beyond what we could have imagined, you know, under Reagan or even George W. Bush, for that matter. Um, but in spite of all that, you have people farming multiple acres, right, of urban land in Detroit. You have schools that are coming up based on an entirely different model, basically based on Grace Lee Boggs's vision of education. Um, you have uh, activists creating peace zones. So peace zones emerge out of the anti-police brutality movement. And what uh, one of my friends, uh, uh, who, who's, who was an elder uh, founder of the Black Panther Party and passed away shortly after Grace, Ron Scott said was, we had done so much to expose the racism and the police brutality. They'd gotten a consent decree, you know, major reforms. But what they really needed to do was basically, you know, promote decriminalization <laughs> and de-escalation, right? So instead of just getting better police, right, and more fair, you know, uh, uh, application of law, what we needed was people to solve their own problems, govern themselves, police themselves, so that eventually we could, most of the police killings were happening because somebody felt they had to call the police. They didn't have an alternative to domestic violence or some kind of fear that they felt, right? And what we needed to do was de-escalate the violence in the first place remove the fear, have people working together cooperatively in the first place, right? So that you don't, and they created that, they called that the Peace Zones for Life movement. They worked with neighborhoods to try to do that. And so if you want to read what, uh, again, uh, my late friend Ron Scott wrote, um, he has a whole pamphlet where he talks about this idea of not just ending police brutality, but creating positive Peace Zones for Life where people don't have to rely on the cops in the first place. And that's the same thing we want, right? We want places where people don't have to rely on Amazon and, 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 and these GM and these big corporations in the first place. So there's another uh, place where um, people on the east side of Detroit, high school students basically learn how to build their own houses. 
using basically not like little 3D printers, but like the big 3D printers that could actually make them make more 3D printers. So there are like five of these, four or five of these like advanced digital fabrication centers set up around the, the country. Um, they started at MIT, and most of them are like MIT, Caltech, and one is this like high school in Detroit <laughs> with this very visionary black entrepreneur that came out of the um, black nationalist movement in the 60s. So again, none of these solve the problem or create a whole new system overnight. But you put these bits and pieces together and you get a very, very different sense of what is possible, what type of creativity uh, is required. Um, and as you know, Grace liked to quote um, Einstein, right? Um, what is it? You know, um, it's, it's imagination is more important than, uh, I'm forgetting the quote. <laughs> Um, it's in my book. <laughs> it's okay. um, or she would say, uh, quoting another uh, thinker, the possible you know, is richer than the real. Right? Like This idea um, that imagination and creativity, that what we really need to, we're, ch we're faced with challenges that humanity has never faced. Right? They're unprecedented. They're on a scale unimaginable. Right? I just saw that you know, Infinity War movie. <laughs> I was thinking about that. You know? We have never faced uh, this type of, you know, um, prospect of mass extinction, you know, in any recent times, right? And we know that almost all of it is because of human, human causation, right? And now we are required to think entirely differently. Like before we even act, the most important thing we do is think entirely differently. That's what Grace talked about, thinking dialectically about the contradictions, about the changing reality, and our responsibility to it. So sorry, that was a very long answer uh, to your question. I know there's more, yeah. Yeah, it's a very complicated question, and it comes up in all of these films. Um, and actually, I took that chapter actually out of the book for a variety of reasons. Um, it it is, does come up in her autobiography, too. right? Um, I think definitely the fact that she was a woman of color, she was a daughter of immigrants, certainly shaped her life. As she says, if I hadn't been born a woman and Chinese, I might have ended up basically an academic working at a philosophy department. right? Instead, she's like, you know, she's in Africa with Kwame Nkrumah. <laughs> she's meeting, you know, with George Padmore uh, and, uh, and this generation that, CLR, that came after CLR James that were leaders of many of the uh, liberation movements, revolutionary liberation movements in Africa. Um, you know, um, she met Malcolm X when they tried to recruit him to uh, run for Senate on the all-black slate in 1964. Uh, in Detroit, when they basically they were challenging the Democratic Party too, as well as the Republican. Um, she had this incredible life, she says, because she never became basically she never had mainstream success, right, within the, the the system. So it's certainly that, certainly the fact that she was a woman of color is what attracted her to civil rights movement, the Black movement, the Black Power movement. But obviously, you know, she became much more. Uh, just, you know, I think at home inside the black movement than in the white women's movement that was emerging, you know, in the 60s. And she was only very tangentially uh, for a short time connected to the Asian American movement, largely because she's in Detroit and there just aren't a lot of Asian Americans there. She helped start this small group of radical uh, Asian American activists. And so this question would get posed to her. And I think, again, it's two things. One is a very practical thing that her activism really predated a lot of these movements of younger people, and so they were sort of politicized around um, these questions of identity in really different ways, right? Um, she never really, really fully understood like the most radical aspects of like you know queer politics, <laughs> um, but obviously she was very sympathetic to you know um, movements against racism, sexism, homophobia. Um, 
I think the other thing, though, is she was in many ways at heart a believer, not in sort of a universal humanism that erases all difference. But she, I think, did on some level believe that, there, that we had that part of our goal was to find some common human connection that linked us. And although, again, she didn't share the right wing's critique of, you know, so-called identity politics or political correctness. She did, I think, believe that there was something that she learned about, again, Marx and humanism um, uh, prior to the rise of, of, of the you know, identity movements um, that she still, f still felt people, I think, needed, needed to understand. Yeah, go um, So there's this quote from Marx that I think about a lot that, where he says, um, you know, which I think kind of gets Communism is for us not a state of affairs uh, which is to be established, an ideal which reality will have to adjust itself to call communism the real movement which abolishes the present state of things and the conditions for this movement result uh, from the premises now in existence. And I've been thinking about how like in the 20th century, something that keeps we keep coming back to is the how capitalism keeps, um, uh, how we confront it reproducing these social relations that bring us back into the, the sphere. And, you know, when thinking about it, this like whole idea of like dual power, you know, what does it mean that, like, how do we confront um, these capitalist social issues? How do we have socialist social relations? And, you know, what would that, that look like? Yeah, I think, definitely, I think she united with a lot of, of that. I mean, the one quote um, that, that she would challenge from Marx was the idea that somehow, and Marx is thinking on this obviously evolved, but when you read the manifesto, you get this sense, and partly the way it's written and because it's a manifesto at, at a certain moment, you get this sense that capitalism itself is creating the seeds of socialist you know, values and cooperation by bringing all the workers together. That in a sense that capitalism is creating a socialized form of production that simply the capitalist takes all the profit from. But eventually, if we could change the ownership, we would have sort of a socialist model of production, right? Um, and I think, you know, Grace talked a lot about how we needed to challenge any, any way, and you can find this in other parts of Marx, but we need to challenge any interpretation that suggests that, that capitalism itself is, is doing this organizing, right? Um, and so there's a lot of writing, and I'm not as familiar with this, but you know, if you read the um, socialism or barbarism work of someone like um, Castoriadis, um, they were thinking about a lot of these questions too, or these ideas in the mid 20th century about the invading socialist societies. There were a lot of debates around that, more again on the fringes, I think, of the kind of you know, official Marxist-Leninist uh, movements of the 20th century. Um, so she's certainly doing a lot about that. I think. The way I've put it, and Grace never actually said this, this is kind of me attributing something to her. Um, in the 20th century, there was a big debate over, you know, could China skip the stage of capitalism and go straight from feudalism to socialism, right? right. And I think what, what the way the Boxers were talking about, places like Utrecht were, can we skip the stage of socialism and go straight from the collapse of capitalism to communism, small c communism, right? So they were, they were less and less concerned, as I said, after 67, with these debates about, you know, again, do you have you know, the state organizing everything? Is it under, uh, uh, do you have it take power through armed struggle? Is it through a one-party state? All those questions that were kind of at the center of official Leninism became really secondary to them, and they were more concerned with, with what you're saying. How do we model small-c communism, right, or some kind of post-capitalist, horizontalist order now? People have criticized them too, saying, well, that's too idealistic, it's not realistic, it doesn't, you know, encounter, you know, it doesn't account enough for what do you do when you have armed opponents, you know, and the state is, you know, uh, um, uh, certainly not going to give up without a fight. Um, those questions that go beyond what Gramsci called the war of position to the actual war of movement, right, um, are, are certainly things that, you know, the people who, who, who critique the Boggses, or more particularly Gracely Boggs, I think, um, would, would point out. Um, and I think, I mean, yeah, that's, that, 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 I think that's an ongoing debate um, and tension. Um, 
but again, it's like, so, you know, Stuart Hall was a very, very important, you know, British, black British cultural uh, studies theorist, Marxist, said, really, you know, people focus, they think the war of movement questions are all the key strategic questions and everything else is just tactical. And then Stuart Hall said, actually, the war of position, the sort of cultural, intellectual, you know, organizing uh, um, is the only game in town. Whether you think cultural, you know, the war position, the kind of cultural revolution is the only game in town, or whether you think it's indispensable, I, I think it's, it's what we need to pay a lot more attention to. And I think a lot of the debates among the kind of formalized left, people who are in left organizations, and I spent most of my 20s in the 1990s trying to like build and unite these types of left groups and understand all their line differences and struggles. Basically, I spent my 20s thinking that like I was born a generation too late and I missed out on all the things people were doing in the 60s and 70s and I was somehow going to try to recreate those things in the 90s. So until I met Grace, that's basically what I was trying to do and I wasn't very successful at it. Um, and that's what also allowed me to, to be more receptive to a different way of thinking about these questions. Um, but a lot of those questions are, are kind of war of movement you know, debates and questions. And I think people are still having those a lot of And I'm not saying they're entirely irrelevant. But I just think that, you know, those questions in so many ways are divorced from the actual questions that people are grappling with in their daily lives, right? Which is why there are actually a lot of people in left organizations that are really, really good at doing that grassroots work because they, they have a practice that at least says, you know, we have to work among the masses with a mass line and mass practice in a different way than what we do when we, you know, have our Communist Party meetings or, or, or gatherings. Um, and, that, and that's good. I think that's really great. A lot of people have dedicated their whole lives uh, to that type of work. Um, but I was attracted to the box of thinking because I realized that there can't be this separation between how we interact with the so-called masses. That what we need to do is actually put into practice our transformative revolutionary values, not by necessarily you know making every you know worker or you know uh, 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 you know uh, homeless person or you know. Um, you know, single mother we meet, like sit down and you know read the communist special, but by but by actually not just saying like, hey, vote for this person who's going to give you health care, but by actually saying like, how are we going to interact with people in ways that address their health needs and concerns, right? Um, and again, that's why Grace is so interested in schools, because that's where she saw it. Everyone sends their kids to schools for the most part, right? Everyone, you know, feels a need for education. And that was a place where you didn't have to sort of uh, convince people to take, you know, <laughs> your children to an event or an organization. People are already going to send their kids to school. How can we change the way we think about education so that people aren't just expecting that education is going to make you more money or get you a better job? That education is a way to change the way we live and think and value and hopefully you know do that in a way that allows people to eat better <laughs> and sleep better and you know live better but not by simply saying education is going to make you more valuable to a corporation who will then give you a higher paying job right that that's what she was trying to get at. and that again is <clears throat> directly trying to impact the way we think and live as opposed to training people to get a better deal from the government or the corporation Yeah. Together. I don't know if you mentioned in your book. I was just wondering what was the relationship with, with that crowd. And then the second question is we had a friend, Barry Bergman, who wrote an essay about kind of in 2011, 2012, comparing the state of Michigan uh, economy to Sweden. Oh. And they had the kind of similar GDP, but the inequality and the, the amount of uh, unemployment is just not comparable. Oh, interesting. So I don't know how do you feel about that comparison because it's like a So Sweden has similar amount of wealth, but distributed much more equally. I mean, I think that's important, right? I mean, you know, people like Paul Krugman talk a lot about how you know Scandinavia has a much more social democratic system. People talk about you know Finland as uh, examples. Um, I think it's important, but we can't escape why there is this big difference. Right? I mean, you know, 
the reason they have so much inequality in Michigan is, is not just because of, you know, um, people have chosen a different model of governance. It's because of the deeply entrenched history of white supremacy, right? Um, and capitalism in this country, too. Uh, but so much of, I mean, let's face it. The reason why black workers were first recruited to Detroit in many ways was to be strike breakers or to undercut the gains that so-called more privileged white male workers had made, right? So there's already that antagonism. And then when black people actually started getting some kind of economic and political power, then, you know, they really started trying to shut down these factories and, 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 and move them, you know, to other parts of the state and eventually other parts of the country and the world. Um, so I think, I think that, that those differences are really important to to, to recognize, but then the analysis of why they're, di they're different is even more important, right? Um, and we don't want to leave that out, that somehow, you know, again, you know, like, the Republicans control every branch of government in Michigan, right? And they gerrymandered the state so much that even though Obama won in 2012, the Republicans controlled the Senate like 27 to 13 or something like that, like, um, it's not even close, right? Um, and so, you know, uh, they controlled everything. And again, it's not purely on the basis of, you know, making a pitch around, you know, uh, um, some kind of economic model, right? It's deeply rooted in white supremacy. Um, first question was about Malcolm X, right? So I picked this up. So yeah, she talked about in this book we did and then in Living for Change. And I think there's, there's two things. At the time, they basically had had a break with the mainstream civil rights leaders. So they were working together with um, Aretha Franklin's dad, C.L. Franklin, was very close to Martin Luther King. Um, he was a very prominent black preacher and a civil rights leader. And they had worked with him to do basically the march uh, um, in Detroit before the March on Washington. King came in and gave a version of his I Have a Dream speech a few months before he did it um, uh, in D.C. 200,000 people uh, marched in Detroit. So it was really huge. I mean, Detroit was that huge. Uh, but then there was a split and uh, basically, you know, over a very similar of the splits happening all throughout the country, uh, Grace and Jimmy went with the Black Power side. There was another very prominent black nationalist preacher named Albert Clegg. He started the Shrine of the Black Madonna. Um, and there were others that later founded the Republic of New Africa. Um, they broke. And when they outreached to Malcolm, it was basically... Uh, if the mainstream civil rights leaders weren't going to allow these kind of radical speakers and ideas in their conference, because that was still time, right, when people like Kennedy and Johnson were saying, look, you want to have any influence over what the White House does, you need to do certain things. Like, right, John Lewis at the March on Washington had to, like, edit his speech, and, you know, there was only certain things that, you know, uh, that Johnson would support. You probably heard all the debates about the movie Selma and, you know, what people think about that. And so there are a lot of civil rights leaders who were kind of tempering their public, you know, uh, 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 positions. Um, as you know, King later broke with uh, the president of Vietnam. But the 63, 64, there was much more of that attempt to try to work with uh, the White House and, and, and the Democrats. Um, and uh, that was why they basically did this separate event with, with Malcolm, right? And, but again, like I said, in retrospect, now uh, Grace would look back and say, you know, there was much more of a possible synthesis between Malcolm and Martin than we understood at the time. At the time, it seemed like there was only one path this way or that way. King was actually a lot more radical than they gave him credit for. Um, and Malcolm was, at the end of his life, a lot more open to embracing a lot of King's ideas than, you know, uh, uh, people portrayed it at the time. So I want to go back to this idea of the war of position. Yeah. Because I think of Red May as being part of the war of position, just like uh, Occupy Wall Street was, in the sense that for the time that Occupy was up, during that time, there was a place in the middle of each city where one could go and talk about what was not being talked about in the news that should have covered it or anywhere else. And uh, we sometimes get obsessed with marxological terms, with doctrine, uh, as opposed to that wonderful quote about communism being the real movement of things, uh, which uh, Mike talked about. And um, I would like to propose the idea that there is not a special method called dialectical materialism that leads to conclusions that bourgeois thought 
won't lead to. Therefore, everybody has to master it and learn the vocabulary and, and cite elements of doctrine. <coughs> but that really, it's a difference between, as I think left of Marx's thought is, between thinking at all, <laughs> clear thought, and no thought. Because what you're talking about, in other words, what I'm saying is you don't have to formulate thought about the economic <coughs> present and what's going on in a particular language or method. There are many venues or ways of getting at this. And the distinction between what used to be called bourgeois thought is it's not thought. It doesn't think the totality. It doesn't think the relations of things. It just talks about symptoms. So I think we should be less obsessed on the. We should be finding languages in the left that are broader languages to say, Basically, what we're talking about is thought versus no thought, not this special doctrine that you have to be trained in. You know, and obviously, you know, Marx, reading Marx, is, is developing the ability to think in a certain way without necessarily getting tied to the doctrine. It's looking at how the economy is working and all, all sorts of other things. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I think that notion of... Uh, you know, finding languages that we can all approach the reality and describing the whole of the reality, the totality of its relationships, as opposed to just dealing with symptoms, which is what mostly happens in the newspaper or in government, is, is probably all one needs to know to be on the extreme left where we are. Yeah, um, Grace once said a quote from C.L.R. James, probably did it more than once, she said, Shakespeare was for all time because he was for his time, right? Um, that what makes someone timeless is not that the truth from whatever it was, 1500 or 1600 or 1800 or 1900 is a timeless reality. It's that there's something that they did at that moment to understand and, you know, make a difference, right? That's what matters, right? And so... She'd say the same thing. Marx was for all time because he was for his time. That what we need to understand is the dialectical method in which people think about reality. Rather than saying that our reality today can rely on the same solutions that Shakespeare came up with or Marx came up with you know, in another period of time. No, they're relevant to understand the type of thinking that people did to break through at a certain moment. That's why she looked at Lenin in a really different way than other so-called Leninists. You know, um, She said the biggest, and this came a lot from C.L.R. James, um, the biggest moment of Lenin's development as a theorist came during the crisis that he experienced during World War I when the socialist parties of the Second International basically supported their ruling class, bourgeois, you know, uh, uh, governments in World War I. It was basically the sellout of socialism, or what Lenin called imperialism, the split in socialism, that required him to go back to reading Marx and Hegel in new ways, and basically coming up with a whole new theory of revolution, which he expresses in imperialism, and then state and revolution, um, and all these other things. Um, and that's, I think, you know, also is sort of uh, corollary to your point about thought versus no thought, right? Yeah, that, and what I'd say about the word dialectics is if you are thinking, you are thinking dialectically even if you never use the word dialectics. <laughs> yeah. Some more comments or questions? Thoughts? I think yeah. I appreciate that, and I also, that's why I, think I appreciate it when I did as a young, young student <laughs> you and Grace in that event was um, the level at which she made it accessible, right? The level at which she worked with people around her to kind of um, <coughs> portray the sense that there are certain things that you can do in the now, right now, and that the level of study comes along with that, but how exactly are your means going to help you get to that, you know? Mm -hmm. To, you know, dealing with the means in the now so that, you know, can have these conversations in rooms like this and, and sort of, you know, deal with ideology, deal with theory and philosophy in these grandiose ways, but still be able to deal with <coughs> the present, deal with the material. And um, so I appreciate that comment, and that's why I also appreciate her work, your work, and everything that you, you said today, um, because it really does <coughs> hone in on some of the difficulties I have when I bring these 
because I guess people who are not familiar or feel they're out of reach, right? Feel that the thinking is, is too much, mm -hmm. um, and so they can't even consider accessing it a little bit. So I, I feel that that work is also largely, largely important. And appreciate. It. Thank you. Yeah, and I think, again, it's a challenge. It's a dialectic, right? I mean, on the one hand, like I said, Grace's ideas are getting more popular now, right? But, and, and it's good that, you know, just like when people are carrying around Mao's Red Book, that they had these ideas that they could easily, you know, spread to others in a very popular, horizontal way, right? But Grace also says, like, ideas need to be dynamic. Once they're fixed, they're dead. Right? And so the last thing, even though I'm thinking about doing like a little book of Grace and James C. Bob's quotes, because I think that would give people more access and an avenue you know, to read more about them, what you don't want is saying like, you're wrong because Grace Lee Bob said this in like, you know, 1987 or, you know, right. like they were doing with, in some cases with Mao, or as, as my friend once said, you know, I was like, well, when you actually read Lenin, you realize he said all these different things, you know, he goes, yeah, why do you think everybody in the left in the 1960s and 70s had that 40 volume collection of Lenin? Because anytime you want to tell someone else you're wrong, you would find some quote, right? And just like, just like some people apparently even do with the Bible, right? They find things that they agree with that somehow, you know, support their view and they ignore these inconvenient truths that are there. So the dialectical way of thinking is we present these ideas in ways that are accessible so people can grasp them, make them meaningful, but not in a way that they become ossified or fixed and dogmas, right? It's with any type of thinking you get about philosophy, religion, spirituality, right? Yeah. I thought um, the city council, I mean, though a, a head tax, small as that, um, isn't going to solve anything. I thought it was successful in that the Seattle Times was kind of the opposition to the head tax, and it got people thinking about how Amazon um, impacts home prices in local communities. Um, at a level that our country wasn't really talking about. And then I was wondering if this massive amount of wealth that these people are accumulating is more theoretical. And like, you know, they said, well, Moses lived to be like 920. Well, then I guess that's possible for someone to have that many billions of dollars. You know, what it's really saying is that they own all this land and they're going to kick us off of it or whatever. It's like, I, so I guess my, my comment is I thought that the council was successful, but what are we supposed to do? I mean, how do we re-educate everybody about what's really happening with capital? And, um, yeah. you know, because our schools aren't going to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I know we're running out of time, so I'll try to answer that on a more general basis. Um, and, you know, I think we really need to think about the relationship between reform and revolution. Uh, in the 20th century, there were these kind of extremes of people who said, you know, um, the only thing, you know, reforms do is basically give people false hope that capitalism is going to solve something. So we need to disabuse people of the idea of reform, you know, get them to vote for, you know, someone other than the Democrats or don't vote at all for any of those people and just join a revolutionary party or join an armed struggle. Then there were others that said, all of that is nonsense, you'll never accomplish anything, it's counterproductive. The only thing we could do is reform, right? And these were the liberals, and you have to work within the system, and everything else is impractical. And obviously there's gray area in between, but those are kind of the poles of thought. Um, and so there emerged this way of thinking amongst you know, people I was reading on the left that said, you use the reform movements to build up your forces, <laughs> expose the problems of capitalism, and then recruit those people from those struggles into the left part. But what Grace is saying is very, very different. That, and it goes in many ways with what we've been talking about. In every reform struggle, you should never dismiss reform struggles because they determine, do people eat? Do people have you know, vaccinations? Do people, can people see a doctor? Do people have a roof over their head when they're cold? Um, so you should never dismiss these reform struggles. And there's a really good discussion about this, as I said, in that Grace Lee Boggs and Emanuel Wallerstein conversation from the social forum, which you can either listen to online or read edited versions of online. Um, so you've been translated in Spanish. The issue um, is not our reforms themselves, you know, good or bad. The issue is when you're fighting to make a difference in people's lives, whether it's through growing an urban garden, creating a new school, creating a childcare collective, does that particular thing you're creating
serve as a model, an example, right, of the bigger values or transformations you're trying to achieve, right? So again, it's not just, oh, we gotta elect all the Democrats because they'll, you know, whatever, help us get more progressive taxation. The reform itself obviously makes a difference, but it's the method, the values that we attach to our grassroots struggles, our reform struggles, sometimes very defensive struggles, um, that really makes a difference, right? Um, and that's what she talked about as visionary organizing, is in the fight over these very practical things sometimes, right? People need to take care of their kids or, 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 or they need health insurance or car insurance. Is there, again, a vision of how this could represent a model to, uh, uh, that can be spread throughout society, right? As something like, she says, the Montgomery bus boycott was. It wasn't just about where you got to sit, sit on a bus, right? It was about people standing up and saying, if we come together, we can challenge these people with the money, we can challenge you know, these people in the white supremacist order, and we can interact with each other based on a whole new set of values and a different model of citizenship, right? That's what she calls visionary organizing, as opposed to, again, people fighting reforms that might be important, but are going to be of, of limited long-term transformational value. So hopefully that's the way you'll approach these things. Um, please feel free to read more Gracie Boggs, disagree with her and challenge her, you know, where you think is appropriate based on changing realities in your own life or in your own local situation. Um, and yeah, hopefully, you know, if you really, really want to experience what these ideas look like in practice, um, there's an event that a lot of people in Seattle activists have been going to in Detroit called the Allied Media Conference. And it's basically you now run and organized um, by people who either worked with Gracie Boggs or now worked with the people who worked with Gracie Boggs and are even younger. Um, so yeah, check that out every June um, in Detroit. It happens at the Wayne State University Allied Media Conference. Thanks so much.